Hello, and welcome to Project 2025, A Warning. I'm Molly Jongfast, writer, podcaster, and person you occasionally see on cable news. And in this episode, we're going to speak to the top experts on how Project 2025, the Heritage Foundation, and its allies are advancing an agenda for Trump's second term that would radically remake America as we know it. But let's get you up to speed. The influential right-wing think tank, the Heritage Foundation, unveiled Project 2025, which instructs the entire federal bureaucracy, including independent agencies such as the Department of Justice, to be placed under presidential control. This basically gives the president a lot more power than previous presidents have had. But don't take my word for it. Let's hear from the brilliant Georgetown historian Thomas Zimmer, who authors the newsletter Democracy Americana, which has done a definitive overview of Project 2025. Project 2025 is is the name of a massive planning operation on the right. It's spearheaded by the Heritage Foundation. It was launched about two years ago in the spring of 2022, and it has brought together much of the right-wing machinery of think tanks and lobbying groups and political institutions with the goal of making sure that the next Republican presidency would be a much more effective, much more ruthless right-wing regime. I think it's best to understand uh, Project 2025 as the American rights declaration of war on the idea of a multiracial, pluralistic, diverse society. Project 2025 is a plan to execute what amounts to a comprehensive authoritarian takeover of American government and transform government into a machine that serves only two purposes. First, exacting revenge on what they call the woke leftist globalist enemy. And secondly, imposing a minoritarian reactionary vision of white Christian patriarchal order on society. And I know you might be thinking this sounds a little crazy and like something one of your aunts who reads too much Facebook sends you, but the Heritage Foundation developed and then linked the Project 2025 mission statement right from their website. The plan is titled Mandate for Leadership 2025, the conservative promise. And they're not trying to hide it. In fact, they go on television and brag about it. And what they brag about is a plan to reshape America in the craziest conservative vision possible. Heritage and the allies who endorse Project 2025 have plans to end no-fault divorce, end the Affordable Care Act, give additional tax breaks to corporations and the 1%, enact a complete ban on abortions without exception, cut Social Security, end climate protections, cut Medicare, defund the FBI and Homeland Security, ban sexual orientation and gender identity education, ban some contraceptives, and greatly limit and regulate in vitro fertilization, ban pornography and imprison anyone who disobeys, ban Muslims from entering the country, elimination of unions and worker protections, raise the retirement age, raise prescription drug prices, eliminate the Department of Education, ban African-American and gender studies at all levels of education, use the military to break up domestic protests, end birthright citizenship, and despite how crazy this all sounds, it's only the tip of the iceberg. Now, you may be thinking the Heritage Foundation isn't Donald Trump's presidential campaign or the Republican Party. After all, Donald Trump has disavowed Project 2025. Like some on the right, severe right, came up with this Project 25, and I don't even know. I mean, some of them, I know who they are, but they're very, very conservative, just like you have. They're sort of the opposite of the radical left, okay? You have the radical left, and you have the radical right, and they come up with this, I don't know what the hell it is, it's Project 25. He's involved in Project, and then they read some of the things, and they are extreme. I mean, they're seriously extreme, but I don't know anything about it. I don't want to know anything about it. But what they do is misinformation and disinformation. Hmm, Donald Trump, you know nothing about it, but you disagree with it? Which is it? Because our country is going to hell. The critical job of institutions such as Heritage is to lay the groundwork. And Heritage does such an incredible job at that. And I'm telling you, with, uh, with Kevin and the staff, and I met so many of them now, I took pictures with among the most handsome, beautiful people I've ever seen. I didn't like that picture. If you could lose that picture, please, would you, Kevin? But this is a great, no, he says I won't do that. But this is a great group, and they're going to lay the groundwork and detail plans for exactly what our movement will do and what your movement will do when the American people give us 
a colossal mandate to save America, and that's coming, that's coming. Trump fired Project 2025 author and Trump campaign staffer Paul Dance from the Trump campaign after this bad Project 2025 polling came out. But what Trump didn't say was that the Project 2025 policy pillar is already written. The recruitment and potential staffing for the Trump administration is still actively going. And here's Heritage Foundation President Kevin Roberts being caught on audio saying Trump is only distancing himself from Heritage for political reasons to win the presidential race. Well, I, I think it's the, the sign of a great leader who understands he's in a, a terrific political news cycle. He's run a really good campaign from start up to this point. And the, the left's mis, mischaracterization of Project 2025 had become a liability. I think we, we've seen that really turn around in the last few days since that statement. So no hard feelings from any of us at Project 2025 about the statement, because we understand Trump is the standard bearer and he's making a political, tactical decision there. But back to Heritage. The Heritage Foundation has been the laboratory for many horrible government policies that have set our country back. And the Heritage Foundation has been the place that much of Republican policy comes from. But don't take my word for it. Here's Senator Marco Rubio. And it's good to see you. And thank you to Heritage for inviting us here giving this opportunity and for all the scholarship that they do here that really serves as a guidepost for a lot of the public policy we choose to make. These policies are drastically unpopular and Trump has tried to cover up his ties to it. Let's talk about those ties. Self-proclaimed Christian nationalist Russ Vaught, he's one of the many authors of Project 2025. He also serves as the policy director of the Republican Party's Platform Writing Committee. You know the policy that was rolled out at the Republican convention in Milwaukee? You may remember the RNC. It's the organization Trump's daughter-in-law runs that pays many, many of his legal bills. And the platform sure has a lot in common with Project 2025. And while Trump tries to distance himself from Project 2025, he's not doing a very good job. He's talked about hiring Project 2025 author and former acting ICE director and an advisor for the family separation policy, Tom Homan, in the next administration to oversee the Mexican border. She was given the responsibility of the border. I have Tom Homan lined up. We have the greatest people. And you may remember right-wing dating app entrepreneur John McEntee, who was Trump's body man and nicknamed deputy president, joined Project 2025 to write the database for who the Trump administration should hire. And Trump's own insiders say that he will be a big part of the next Trump administration. Just tell us what you're doing, Harris. You two are now working together. These guys have come up with the plan that on the victory, the, se the third victory, the second term, we hit the deck plates runner, right? There's 4,000 appointees by a president, 4,000 to run the entire government. 1,000 of those, I think, have to be Senate confirmed. But 3,000 can start work day one. Walk through what you guys are doing, I know, and I keep asking. Do you work for Johnny or does Johnny work for you, right? But I definitely work for John. That's so what we're doing with Project 2025 is we're recruiting the MAGA America First Republicans right now so that we can take D.C. by storm in 2025. We're not going to go in like we did in 2017, where the establishment took over and co-opted much of the personnel of President Trump's administration. We're more prepared this time. We're recruiting grassroots conservatives. And we want all of you, if you want to serve in the next White House, next State Department, next Pentagon, we want you to sign up. Tell your sons, tell your daughters, tell all your friends. It's project2025.org. So, Johnny, okay, you heard that? If you guys want to serve, you've got to get engaged now. You've got to be involved now. Because one of the big parts of this is networking. It's not just training people up, but those networks that we do with grassroots organizations, with other organizations. Walk through, tell me what the plan is. So we're collecting resumes. We're getting as much information as we can now to save the transition time on the back end. As you know, when a president wins, or president-elect wins, Things happen very quickly and you have a short amount of time to staff an entire administration. It's also looking beyond the 4,000 and what we can do with the bureaucracy itself. So we're thinking of creative policy things as well that will integrate with this. But Trump's clearest tie to Heritage and Project 2025 is his choice of J.D. Vance as vice president. 
an abortion hardliner who seems gleeful at the idea of taking away women's rights. And funny enough, the Associated Press reported Kevin Roberts, the president of the Heritage Foundation, said at the organization's policy fest in Milwaukee that he is good friends with Vance and that the Heritage Foundation had been privately rooting for Trump to choose Vance as his running mate. But a clear sign of Trump's tether to Project 2025 is that Trump's name appears in the document 312 times. These two things are in fact one in the same. And just as Project 2025 is a complex web of organizations and expertises, they fall into an ecosystem that will influence Trump. Here's UC Davis, School of Law, law professor and author of Roe, The History of a National Obsession, Mary Ziegler. One is that Project 2025 is a coalition effort, right? So Heritage led this, but it got buy-in from over a hundred other conservative groups. So this really reflects the best ideas that a big cohort of people on the right have had, not just Heritage. The other really interesting thing is that a lot of the people who work at Heritage now or who wrote Project 2025 are very close to Donald Trump. And I think there's a, a clear understanding on the part of Heritage that getting influence in a potential second Trump administration is not just about having the smartest people in the room, it's about having the people that Donald Trump will listen to in the room. And so a, a lot of what you see in Project 2025 is being offered by people who worked in the first Trump administration. And I think on the theory that these are people Donald Trump is much more likely to bring back or at least you know, entertain than lots of other people who are conservative. So, I, I mean, I take Project 2025, not like I didn't take Heritage seriously or they didn't have influence in the past, they did. But I think Project 2025, I view as being in a kind of different category for all those reasons. And the reason to take it so seriously is that with Project 2025, it will get even easier to get the craziest policies enacted. It's as if they have figured out that part of it is figuring out what you can get past, but part of it is figuring out how you can speak to Donald Trump. Totally. Yeah. And I think that's a big part of because I think that's a big, a huge, huge part of it, because um, the anti-abortion movement in the before Dobbs was all about figuring out how you speak to the Supreme Court. And right. that's still going on. But the heritage now, Project 2025, you can read it as like, how do you convince like, how do you find in the Venn diagram the thing that will convince Donald Trump and Brett Kavanaugh at the same time, right? That's like the sweet spot right now. <laughs> and if that didn't convince you, here's Heritage Foundation President Kevin Roberts, and he's going to show you just how serious they are. We are going to win. We're in the process of taking this country back. No one in the audience should be despairing. No one should be discouraged. We ought to be really encouraged by what happened yesterday. And in spite of all of the injustice, which of course, friends and audience of this show, of our friend Steve know, we are going to prevail. Well, that sounds threatening. We are in the process of the second American revolution, which will remain bloodless if the left allows it to be. Hmm, I'm starting to think they may be very serious about making this happen. Roberts also said that he saw Heritage's role as institutionalizing Trumpism. Adding the Trump administration with the best of intentions simply got a slow start. And Heritage and our allies in Project 2025 believe that must never be repeated. And if you aren't scared yet, Roberts admits the worst of what's in his plan isn't in the public version. The basis of the plan is public. You can see that at project2025.org. There are parts of the plan that we were, will not share with the left. The executive orders, the rules and regulations, just like a good football team, we don't want to tip off our playbook to the left. So now that we've established this is the plan that Trump will use to reshape America that will be even more insane than his last rule over this country. Here's Thomas Zimmer to explain. The diagnosis from which they start, from which all of these planning efforts on the right start, is that they see the first Trump administration as a failure. Like, they are very clear that they weren't ready. Trump world wasn't ready in 2017. They had no plans. They had no personnel to implement whatever plans they didn't have. And they had very little understanding of the vast and powerful machine that is the American government. And again, no one understands this better than they do. And they think that they were, because they had, didn't have personnel, they, they had to rely on these people like normal lawyers and bureaucrats and like normal people, right? <laughs> and they see, they think these people sabotage them. And so this time, again, they feel like we're going to have plans. We're going to purge the American government from all these people who sabotaged us in, in the, the first time around. We're going to replace them with 
an army of thousands of loyalists and ideological conformists who they are looking actively looking for. That is part of Project 2025. The policy agenda is only one part of Project 2025. The overall planning operation goes far beyond that. They're, again, they're looking for thousands of people that they can put into government, into these positions. What would that amount to? I mean, look, the first thing it would amount to is a vastly worse government. Because a lot of these people just, these are government jobs. They're not yes. partisan. And so you're yes. removing people like from the EPA, yes. which they hate the EPA, but you still want to make sure your water doesn't have lead in it, right? I mean, there are certain small that things that will be fucked up that we can't even sort of quantify, right? Yes. I think, again, this is probably the point of maybe talk about how extreme the vision of sort of a purge is that they want to institute here, right? They want to come in and look, there's about 4,000 political appointees in American government, right? And every administration, uh, when they come in, they look at all these political appointments. These are people sort of at the higher end of all these uh, departments and agencies. And every administration looks at them. And every administration um, replaces, you know, the number of fluctuates, but usually about a thousand people or so, right? So every administration brings in about a thousand people. But other than that, they let these normal people, bureaucrats, civil servants, they let them do their job because that's the whole point about the civil service is you have people who are insulated from direct political control and they are experts, they know their jobs, they do their jobs, right? So, so, so untouched by, you know, oh, there's a new administration uh, who are going to replace the whole personnel. Now, Project 2025 wants to do something entirely different. They want to come in and convert tens of thousands of career civil service positions into political appointments, starting with anyone, they say, in sort of a policy adjacent position or a policy advisory role, but these terms really don't mean anything. The goal is to strip all these people of their civil service protections in order to make them fireable and then fire them. Because again, if you have civil service protection, you can't just be fired for no reason. But they want to convert them into political appointments, fire them, and then replace them with an army of loyalists and ideological conformists. They're talking about numbers, again, fluctuate, but something like 50,000 people. that They want to come in, fire, replace by their own people. But think about who they want to bring in here. These would be people whose sole qualification is that they are ideologically on board with the Trumpist project. These wouldn't be experts, right? These wouldn't be people with many years, even decades of experience in these, again, highly specialized, highly technical jobs. These would just be ideological conformists. And again, this would make government so much worse. It would make government vastly less functional, right? Even beyond just the fact that it would turn government into sort of this uh, authoritarian uh, revenge machine, it would just function worse, right? Because you have people who just have no idea what they're doing. And Heritage itself has been one of the organizations taken over by a more radical element of the right. Here's Rhode Island Senator Sheldon Whitehouse to explain. It brings the um, long history of far-right billionaires trying to meddle in our politics together with the dark money apparatus that the Koch brothers specialized in creating after Citizens United, now uh, rebooted in MAGA format, I think probably to kind of nudge the Koch brothers operation out of the Republican political space and take it over with MAGA Trump people. And he believes a deal was brokered that allowed this to happen. But it's that same dark money, smelly, billionaire-funded operation that is now rearing its head through Project 2025. And here's Representative Jared Huffman of California's 2nd District, who heads the Democratic Task Force on Project 2025 and how to stop it. Even some of the seemingly innocuous parts of Project 2025, like bringing the FCC uh, under direct pre presidential power, ending the independence that many of these agencies have typically had. What's that about? Well, it's about President Trump having basically singular power over which corporate mergers go through and how we control the media. It's important to understand Project 2025 is made of four pillars. The reason they picked four pillars is because they want the Trump administration to be able to remake America as quickly as possible. This is their own terminology. The first pillar is a policy agenda that is spelled out in their 900 page mandate for leadership, a conservative promise. The second pillar is a personal database intended to build an army of loyalists. These loyalists will replace public servants. The third pillar is what they call a training effort. 
that currently consists of online courses so that these loyalists can be very effective in implementing their right-wing agenda. They call it the Presidential Administration Academy. And here's Thomas Zimmer again to explain the fourth pillar. Now this fourth pillar, this playbook, this sort of emergency playbook for the first uh, six months in power, at this point is still distinctly vague and it seems to exist only in the form of sort of an announcement of future action. So that has not been published yet. They're working on this. Um, that's not out there. Hi. I just want to stop for a second. The reason we put this on YouTube for free is we want to spread the word as much as possible. It would really help us if you comment, click like, and send this to a friend or three. Thank you so much. Okay, back to the video. But it's important to understand that while I think this is an organization plotting to destroy what so many of us love about America, it is actually a movement that is a reaction to what so many of us actually love about America. The one thing they can all agree on is, first of all, they hate the left more regardless of how much they, and by left, they really mean like any attempt at leveling sort of discriminatory hierarchies of race, gender, religion, and wealth, right? That's what they call the left. Um, so this is not like a, a narrow sense of the American left and like, a, you know, something that maybe you and I would call the left. Broadly, it's like any attempt to make this into anything but a society that is defined by white Christian patriarchal domination. That's the left. Um, they are convinced that they are under siege by this leftist egalitarian project. They are convinced that the quote-unquote left has basically managed to overtake all institutions of American life, including the American government. They really believe this, by the way. They really believe in these sort of conspiratorial ideas of a vast leftist, communist, socialist, woke. It doesn't matter. They just use these terms interchangeably. For them, again, anything that levels discriminatory hierarchies is just left, socialist, communist, woke, doesn't matter. And they really believe there's this vast conspiracy that has taken over all institutions of American life. And so they're all convinced. And when I say all, I mean all these different factions on the right, they are convinced that sort of quote unquote normal conservatism is just not enough to sort of save their understanding of quote unquote real America. And so they lust for this sort of more radical politics and what they now openly and, and sort of aggressively refer to as a counter revolution. And that's how they define their project as sort of a counter revolutionary project against the supposed leftist takeover of America. And now they are even rhetorically, openly, aggressively throwing all that overboard and are basically saying, no, we need to weaponize the state, we need to weaponize government, mobilize the coercive powers of government against our enemies. And they're giving themselves permission by basically saying, look, the left has already gone much further. Everything we do is only in reaction to a radicalized leftist, woke, globalist, whatever enemy that has already started its revolutionary assault on America. They truly believe that they are sort of under siege. They see themselves, all of these people, and you see this when you read Project 2025, they have completely given up on this idea, completely given up, completely accepted the fact that they are in the minority and that only ever more authoritarian measures can keep them in power. That's precisely sort of the big shift that has happened here. And here is Paul Dance, who directs Heritage's 2025 Presidential Transition Project, saying what we actually already know. This is really projection 2025 on behalf of the left. It's not Project 2025. So whatever they're saying, you know, pointing at us with their finger, they have four fingers pointing back at them. Remember everyone who died from COVID. Remember that disastrous pullout in Afghanistan, even remember what happened on Saturday. All these are products of this deep state and we need to reinfuse political control over this bureaucracy. And that's the importance of Project 2025. And here's Harvard sociologist and political scientist, Theda Scotch Pohl, who is the author of The Tea Party and the Remaking of Republican Conservatism, discussing how these motivations came to being when Trump took power. Donald Trump personally is what social scientists call an intervening variable. He didn't cause the various tensions in society and politics that he has known how to maximize and exploit. And if he, for example, becomes president a second time, it's very clear he's going to be obsessed a hundred times more from what he was always obsessed with, which is what can I personally and my family milk out of the federal government in the way of wealth? And how can I use the federal government to put on a show and play out my angers and resentments against people I consider to be enemies. But he has assembled around him 
a set of forces. Right. I would say he plays a personal role and has always in kind of signaling to large numbers of grassroots people, some of whom came out of the party Tea Party networks, some of whom are very um, conservative Christian right people, others of whom are gun people. These are networks, some of which have an organizational base to them. And he knew how to knit them together and to highlight their issues and their angers and to tell them that he would be the enemy of the people he says are their enemies. So his ability to communicate with and create a kind of resonance with a lot of angry and fearful people is a potent political ingredient that he personally has brought to it and now he's wielding in the form of threats of humiliation and violence against people. So I'm not saying that's not crucial, but I am saying that it's incomplete because the real issue isn't Donald Trump so much as the entire Republican Party and sets of organized elite groups that believe they can ride this tiger to the goals they want without the tiger consuming them. And here she is explaining how this will change America. I think they'll concentrate on key agencies. They'll concentrate on the ones that Trump feels can carry out what he wants, which is to enrich himself and his family and get rid of the legal cases, and that organized groups led by the likes of Stephen Miller want to pursue, which is to purge immigrants. They know, surely, what we should all keep in mind, which is immigrants are not neatly sorted into documented versus undocumented. They come in families, hardworking families that have uh, some members who are in one category, some in another. Entire families will leave, move, uh, either in the United States or even leave the United States. They'll leave the dairy industry in the Midwest. They'll leave the construction industry in Florida, which is already happening. Health care for old people will suffer terribly. Uh, all of these things will not be popular as their economic implications play out. One of the animating forces behind Project 2025 is that they don't like confident women making their own choices. Their animosity towards women's rights and women's progress is something they practically advertise. But one of the things to understand here is that the mandate for leadership creates the ideas that ultimately trickle down to state legislatures. The Heritage Foundation becomes an incubator for some of the worst and dumbest conservative policy that, in worst case scenario, rises all the way up to the Supreme Court and becomes laws for the entire nation. Here's law professor Mary Ziegler. States are introducing new bans even as they already have existing bans. We're starting to see more interest in conservative states in limiting travel for abortion. We're seeing conservative efforts to introduce a kind of backdoor federal ban on abortion through the Comstock Act that they're hoping a potential Trump administration would enforce. And we're also seeing, I think, leakage or slippage between the concepts of contraception and birth control that could have a lot of consequences, too. So, I mean, big picture, you know, the U.S. Supreme Court, when it overturned Roe v. Wade, was essentially saying, well, sure, you know, everybody's going to lose this fundamental right, and that's kind of too bad. But on the bright side, the abortion conflict will simmer down because the real problem was Roe v. Wade. So once we, the Supreme Court, like exit stage left, everyone is just going to get along better. And this conflict is not really going to exist anymore. And it turns, you know, it turns out that that's not true, right? Um, and yeah. it turns out that not only that, but the U.S. Supreme Court has more abortion cases than right. ever before, not fewer. So the kind of general picture is sort of is chaos. And one of the reasons you see people like Stephen Miller and Donald Trump running away from Project 2025 is because because a lot of the legislation it proposes is wildly unpopular. Right? I mean, the most kind of revealing quote about this was when Jonathan Mitchell was talking to the New York Times and he said, you know, it's better if, you know, right to lifers don't talk about this at all until after the election. And I hope Donald right. Trump doesn't know what the Comstock is, Act is because I don't want him to run his mouth. And one of the core tenets that Heritage is using to claim reproductive rights is fetal personhood. The idea that a fetus is a human person, just like anyone else, and killing a person is murder. And that is how they attack IVF and contraception. If you look at the the heritage documents, there's no even pretend. There's just like, why don't we regulate IVF? Let's not regulate Exxon, because oil companies are fine. Let's not regulate cigarettes. Let's not regulate but we have to regulate IVF. So, I mean, there are, two, there are two things going on here, right? One is that if you buy the argument that fetuses and embryos are persons, then IVF might be weird to you, right? Because you'll see anti-abortion people saying, well, we can't 
put children in freezers and we can't donate children for research and we can't destroy children. So once you kind of go down that road, that's part of what's going on. I think the other thing that's going on in the background is that often beliefs about personhood travel alongside beliefs about gender, sex, sort of the right. idea that there are God-given gender roles, that those are necessary to human flourishing. And I think there's always been a subset of people within the anti-abortion movement who are disturbed by IVF because they see it as sort of antithetical to the idea that children are only born when straight married people have sex or that it sort of is used in ways that subvert their, their beliefs vis-a-vis -vis gender and sex, right? You have lots of queer families that use IVF. You have single parents, single women who use IVF. So I think it's both about personhood, but also about this kind of constellation of beliefs that often travel alongside personhood. And the Heritage's advisors who backed Project 2025 are the same people who at the state level continue to push contraceptive bans. So with close proximity, to the planning of the next Trump administration, it's easy to see where this is all going. So part of the the pushback against contraception is a definitional thing. Like another interesting feature is that um, since Dobbs, several states have um, reformed their definitions of abortion to remove language that excludes contraceptives, right? The, so um, that's wow. created some kind of gray area. Uh, they haven't, you know, said that contraceptives are abortion patients either. They're just leaving that to the imagination. The other thing I think that's happening is that, again, many conservatives have been uncomfortable with contraception going back some time too, viewing, you know, separating sex and reproduction as immoral or as encouraging promiscuity or as unnatural or as contrary to their religious teachings. So we're starting too to see some conservatives mount efforts to criticize contraception, not as abortion, but just to say contraception is bad as contraception. The most obvious at the moment focus unsurprisingly on, on minors, right? So saying minors shouldn't be able to access contraception and their parents don't want them to. We've started to see some arguments that kind of parallel ones we saw about abortion, where you're hearing them say, well, contraceptives are dangerous and they increase the risk right. of depression and cancer. Right. Kind of the same thing we saw with abortion. And we're seeing, I think, one of the interesting things too is, you know, a lot of kind of behind the scenes efforts to defeat right to contraceptive bills even when conservatives are not always putting out front why they oppose contraception, they don't want right to contraception bills either. And the Supreme Court is already at work clearing the way to ban abortion and ban abortion travel. Here's Slate's senior editor and author of Lady Justice, Dahlia Lethwick. This is the plan and we are seeing it. I mean, it's 900 pages, there's a lot to chew over, but huge parts of it are already being, you know, previewed and kind of built into the law even before 2025 is put into action. And so one huge part of it, you're exactly right, Molly, is the sort of dismantling the regulatory state, right? Whatever, was it Grover Norquist who was like, we're going to shrink government down to the size that we can, you know, drown it in a bathtub. And this was the Steve Bannon wish list, right? This was the dream that we're going to end the administrative state as we know it. And that is all absolutely in the pages of Project 2025. And the other stuff that's in the pages of Project 2025, the court has absolutely hand delivered, whether it's, you know, making it harder to vote, whether it's cracking down on immigrants. I mean, the court is embodying an enthusiasm for Project 2025 that really belies the idea that we're kind of having in the conversation now of like, is next year gonna be Project 2025 or not? It's already happening, it's just happening in the judiciary. One of the things that Project 2025 wants to do is to dismantle a bunch of government agencies, including the Department of Education. You can't do these things unless you empower the judiciary to rubber stamp them, right? Right. I mean, Project 2025, a lot of it can exist without the judiciary, right? A lot of it is going to be, you know, seize Biden regulatory attempts to make abortion accessible and flip it on its head and use it to make abortion inaccessible, right? So a lot of it is going to flip what agencies do. You know, we're going to do away with food stamps and we're going to do away with, you know, all sorts of ways of ameliorating poverty and stuff. So part of it is going to happen by fiat, by way of agencies. But you're exactly right that once you have conferred on the judicial branch, the power to decide whether or not that is lawful, then you're exactly right. The, the, the judicial branch becomes the rubber stamp. I think it's important to note here that Project 2025 is supported by a coalition of over 100 conservative organizations. There are many factions 
but this looks to get them all working together. Here's Thomas Zimmer again. This is actually interesting. So Steve Bannon is not Project 2025, right? So he's no. not involved directly in this in this project, nor is Trump, right? So it's really right. important to understand there are different factions on the right, Trump and Trump campaign being one of them, but there are others and they're all involved in some kind of planning operation. And Project 2025 is, is one of those. It stands out because it has of united so much of the right wing machinery, but there are different factions. What is interesting about sort of these other parts, Trump himself or Bannon, sort of referring to Project 2025 is that I think it would be a really big misunderstanding to look at this and say, oh, it's not Trump and Trump doesn't care about these big plans and like, okay, they can put out like a thousand page policy report. Who cares? Trump's not going to read it. I think that would be a big misunderstanding. These people who are involved in Project 2025, they are well connected to other parts of the right. They are well connected to the right wing, even the most extremist fringe, some of the key actors behind Project 2025. Again, they are closely connected to Bannon. They go on Bannon's podcast. They talk to him, but they're also closely connected to the inner circle around Trump. Partly, they're even, even officially part of, of Trump campaign efforts. So these, these are all connected efforts. They're not all the same, and there are even rivalries between these different factions. They don't all like each other. You know, they will in case Trump were to win the election. I'm sure they would be sort of fighting over influence and power. You know, that's, that's, you know, that's just how that stuff goes. But again, this is deeply and intimately connected to all parts of the right. And the most important thing is they really fundamentally agree on the broad outlines of what they want to do with power. So even if you want to say, oh, this isn't exactly the right thing that the Trump campaign is putting out there in broad strokes, they are very much in agreement about what they want to do with power if they get back to the White House. And when Thomas mentions people going on Bannon's podcast and boldly discussing their plans to jail journalists and exact revenge on anyone who holds them accountable for breaking laws. Here's Bannon with Cash Patel, who Trump insiders believe will run the CIA. Do you feel conf confident that you will be able to deliver the goods, that we can have serious prosecutions and accountability? And I want the Morning Joe producers that watch us and all the producers that watch us. This is just not rhetoric. We're absolutely dead serious. We're not. You, you cannot have a constitutional republic and allow what these uh, deep staters have done to the country. The deep state, the administrative state, the fourth branch of government never mentioned in the Constitution is going to be taken apart brick by brick. And the people that did these evil deeds will be held accountable and prosecuted, criminal prosecutions. Uh, Cash, I, I know you're probably going to be head of the CIA. But do you believe that you can deliver the goods on this in a pretty short in a pretty short order of the first couple of months so we can get rolling on prosecutions? Yes, we got the bench for it, Bannon, and you know those guys. I'm not going to go out there and say their names right now so the radical left wing media can terrorize them. But <clears throat> excuse me, the one thing we learned in the Trump administration the first go round is we got to put in all America patriots top to bottom. We will go out and find the conspirators, not just in government, but in the media. Yes, we're going to come after the people in the media who lied about American citizens, who helped Joe Biden rig presidential elections. We're going to come after you, whether it's criminally or civilly, we'll figure that out. And many people have claimed this is hysterical, an overreaction, that the guardrails have guarded against things like this before, and there'll be massive protests in the street. But they have plans for that, too. Here's Thomas Zimmer again. Clearly, one of the big regrets that they have, and I mean they, meaning Trump himself, but also the people behind Project 2025, is that they didn't invoke the Insurrection Act in the summer of 2020 to go into these blue cities and oppress uh, the protests in the wake of the murder of George Floyd. Very clearly and very openly, they say that was a mistake. That was a mistake because we were listening to these lawyers in and around the White House who had sort of qualms about legality and precedent and norm and all that good stuff. And they think that was a big mistake. That's what Trump means when he says there was a big Time magazine piece where they had sort of long interviews with Trump. And it started with uh, a Trump quote saying, I was too nice the first time around. That's exactly how these Project 2025 people also feel. We were too nice. We were listening to these people who said to us, you should not invoke the Insurrection Act, which would have allowed them to sent federal troops into like Washington DC to oppress protests. And so when they say 180 day playbook, like emergency measures, 
Like that's the stuff that's on the table here, right? Like how about we we invoke the Insurrection Act to quote unquote restore order, which means oppressing protests. And all of this is to say, when Trump says he'll be a dictator on day one, he's making a promise, not making a joke. And again, Christians get out and vote just this time. You won't have to do it anymore. Four more years, you know what? It'll be fixed, it'll be fine. You won't have to vote anymore, my beautiful Christians. I love you, Christians. I'm a Christian. I love you. Get out. You got to get out and vote. In four years, you don't have to vote again. We'll have it fixed so good you're not going to have to vote. But please don't despair. There are things you can do. I know some of you have friends who are thinking about sitting this vote out or even think things should get worse before they get better. But the damage in this plan and Trump's second term will leave America unrecognizable. Call your congressperson and tell them you support the Disclose Act, which will make money in our politics more transparent and discourage the rich from donating to nefarious organizations, as well as help us finally slow down climate change. Here's Senator Sheldon Whitehouse. Disclose Act is very important so that Americans can see who's funding their politicians. Basically, the Supreme Court said We're going to allow unlimited amounts of money in politics in Citizens United because it's all going to be transparent. So the voters are never going to be fooled. They'll know who's spending the money and they can take that into account. Well, of course, that wasn't true. They went running off into the 501c4s and the Supreme Court has tellingly never bothered to enforce that supposed part of its decision. So now you've got all this enormous uh, amount of money coming through. But under the Supreme Court's decision, Congress can regulate that. We could require disclosure because the Supreme Court actually said there would be disclosure. So we have a bill to do that, over $10,000 in a race, and you've got to disclose who you are, and not just the first level of the Russian nesting doll. You've got to go all the way back to the true beneficial owner. So if you applied that, it would take away the ability of a billionaire to run, let's say, $100 million through donors' trust into a 501c4 and onto a super PAC without anybody knowing ever who that billionaire was. You'd actually have the ability to track back any money spent in elections to the real, actual, true donor. And then frankly, to have the IRS get back up on its, you know, feet and dust itself off and start investigating 501c3 and 501c4 mischief and make referrals to the Department of Justice, which has the ability to actually prosecute fraud and false statements and things like that. One other fact that your listeners should know is that back when I got to the Senate, we were doing bipartisan climate work all the time. John McCain carried the Republican banner into the presidential race with a terrific climate platform. Citizens United, January of 2010, killed all bipartisanship on climate, and it has never revived since. Only on eensy teensy little bills that make no real difference. Because the oil companies had too much power then. Bingo. They stepped up. They were the first ones to take advantage of the unlimited money and of the 501c4 secrecy. And they went into the Republicans and said, hey, guys, look what we can do now to help you. We can crush the Democrats. We can bomb them with negative advertising a year ahead of the election, which they did. Uh, But if you want that kind of money, if you want that kind of bombardment to support you, you're going to have to tell all your Republicans to knock it off on climate change. That has to become a partisan issue. And a second Trump administration will be an unmitigated disaster for slowing climate change. Here's Representative Jared Huffman again. We don't have time to wait for the market to uh, realize all of that. Uh, we've got a climate crisis that is compelling us to, to speed up. And that's where Project 2025 in, in the clean energy and environmental space isn't necessarily anything new. We've seen this right wing agenda for years. But the fact that they're proposing to run out the clock on another four to eight years could be the end game for our ability to confront the climate crisis. And if you want change, you need to let your lawmaker know that you support getting money out of politics. If you look behind the climate denial operation, you find dark money. If you look behind the operation that captured the Supreme Court and turned it into a tool of the right-wing billionaires, you find dark money. And the dark money operation is now very widespread in politics. You look behind creepy super PACs and there's uh, dark money controlling voters through uh, news that is not leavened by knowing who the source is. So I think that the, the evil that makes so many other evils possible is the enormous power of huge special interests and creepy right-wing billionaires to hide who they are and meddle in politics in ways that A, make them a fortune, 
they're not doing this just ideologically. They are making big money off of this. And B, to accomplish what they could not accomplish through regular democracy and democratic processes. So to me, dark money is the root of all these evils. And the sooner we can rid our politics of it and figure out who's behind 501c3s and 501c4s and all of that, the better off we'll be. That puts citizens back in charge of their democracy. They're no longer being fed nonsense by people they can't even identify. And I think that'll make for a much better America, much better democracy. The pressure will come down when people aren't being bombarded in their TVs by groups that they know are phony. Nobody ever bought a product from Americans for peace and puppies and prosperity, whatever all these groups are called. Please, please, please show this to a friend who is considering not voting. Sit down and talk to them. Make it clear to them that Project 2025 will reshape America in ways that are so horrible and so enormous that it's hard for any of us to fully realize. Get them to register to vote and even take them to the polls. Take the day off and make a day of it if you can. We need everyone we can to vote against Trump heritage and the radical reshaping of America. Here's Representative Jared Huffman again. The most definitive way to stop this is to win the election. That's the point that we're really trying to make here is the American people have an opportunity to kill this in its tracks. And we got to do that because, yeah, we'll keep fighting if we don't win, but there are no guarantees. Thank you so much for watching this episode. We made this series so that you can educate others in your life about the very real threat to America that Trump's second term would pose. Project 2025 will remake the federal government. And it's really important that you share this with a friend. Click like on the video and comment so it spreads to more people on YouTube. If you want more interviews like this, subscribe to Fast Politics on your favorite podcast app. Thanks for watching.